pleasure of, of, uh, of working with Richard Martin, the senior director at, at Merrill Data Site, Merrill Corporation now, um, over the last seven years. I credited him earlier today for the creation of our 40 Under 40 Now Emerging Leaders Awards program, which I think has been transformative for our organization and, and I, I, I do believe for our industry. And I also credit Richard with, uh, with our evolution uh, as a facilitator of thought leadership. We really, while, while we, we, we know a little bit about M&A, most importantly, we know who to talk to about the subjects that we think are most meaningful and, and relevant for you. So we really see ourselves as your publisher and, and your producer. And I have, I have Richard Martin to thank for that uh, as an instigator, uh, an inspirer, uh, a co-conceiver co and, and creator. And it's a great pleasure to, to welcome Richard to the stage to, to introduce Campbell McPherson, who I think you'll be as enchanted with as, as I've become. And I'm looking forward after Campbell's remarks to, to share a, a very dynamic initiative that we're kicking off here today. Richard? Business advisor, facilitator, author, speaker, change catalyst. These are but a few of the titles that describe our next speaker. He believes passionately in the power of clarity and aligning people to deliver. Your people are the only ones who can deliver your strategy. He has been enabling organizations to successfully instigate sustainable change for almost 30 years across the UK, Europe, the US, Asia, Australia, and the Middle East. What drives our next speaker is a burning desire to make a positive difference to the way that organizations work and the impact that they can have on customers, employees, and their shareholders. His remarkable wealth of experience includes acting as a senior advisor to the Abu Dhabi Investment Authority, strategic strategy director for Zurich Global Life, a board member and director for Sesame, the UK's largest IFA network, and these are but a few. And then finally, to add to this, uh, he has also flown jets in the Royal Australian Air Force, which he claims he did poorly, but I don't really believe that for a minute, Campbell. So uh, please join me in welcoming Campbell McPherson, an accomplished, insightful, and acclaimed motivational speaker, and the author of a new business book published by Wiley called The Change Catalyst, Secrets to Successful and Sustainable Business Change. Campbell. Thanks, Richard. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, actually, yes, it was entirely true. I was the worst, I had the record, actually, of being the world's, uh, Australia's worst pilot ever to make it through to jets. Uh, I could take off, I could fly around, but because I had to memorize the eye chart at the time, uh, landings were always a little bit sudden and um, a little more unexpected than they, than they should have been. Um, today's talk is about the inevitability of change. Change is inevitable. Successful change isn't. And one of the first, the first thought that I'd like you to take away with, uh, to, to take away with you, is that your organizations will need to change. I don't mean that as an insult. I don't even mean it as a criticism. It's just a statement of fact. In fact, it doesn't matter how successful your organization is, because the more successful an organization, the harder, the more, uh, uh, the bigger, uh, the, the, the more impactful the change will be when it actually comes. So first is your organizations will need to change. Secondly, it doesn't just go to you, for your organizations. It goes doubly for the organizations that you invest in, because the leadership of the organizations you invest in the number one skill they will have to have is to be able to lead their organizations through change. We've seen all this morning Dr. Lee's fantastic presentation about the changes ahead. In fact, uh, in 10 years' time, uh, we'll, we'll need a room half as big because 50% of us will be replaced by robots. Possibly not looking as cool as Rachel did, but still, you know, change is inevitable. It's coming. So you're going to have to help, put it this way, the in companies you invest in, if they don't know how to lead change properly, if they don't know how to, to deliver the business case that they set out to achieve, then your investment will be in a waste of money. So there's two versions of it. But for you guys, there's three. There's three different types of changes that you're going to have to cope with. And the third one is personal change. You are going to have to change personally. We all are. Because the way that we do things today just won't cut it uh, in 10 years' time or in the future. In fact, I love that story that David told about of his, of his, um, 
a conference in Dusseldorf when everyone sat around and talking at a very high level as we normally all do. Yes, my organization has to change. Uh, yes, we've got to cope with all this wonderful technology change. Actually, they cut it down very, very, very quickly to say, I'm really frightened about my job. So change is personal. And that's another thing that we'll find out. But as change leaders, every single one in this room have to do all of the three things I've talked about before. And finally, the fourth and most important thing is you will have to lead your people to deliver the change that your business requires because only your people can deliver that change. Only your people, or Rachel, only your people can deliver the strategy uh, actually, your strategy. Benjamin Disraeli said this 150 years ago. He said, change is inevitable, change is constant. Now, he was a, a, a twice Prime Minister of Britain. Change is inevitable, change is constant. What he meant, though, was that change is not so much constant as it's always you know, flatline. It means it's always with us. What he didn't say is the pace of change is accelerating. We have seen that all morning with wonderful presentations. So he didn't say that the change of, of pace is uh, accelerating, and he should have, because that is precisely what is happening. Globalization, as we've seen, the internet, it is changing the world beyond uh, anything uh, that, we've, that we've seen to date. What he would have seen, what he could have seen in the last 150 years would have left him absolutely gobsmacked. The change we, we've seen since then is amazing. 150 years ago, there were one billion people on the planet, even less, even, even fewer people. Now there's 7.2 billion people on this planet. The change in the last 50 years, of course, saw whizzing around the screen then has been quite incredible. That last picture is Dubai Airport 50 years ago. It is now the largest, busiest airport in the world. But that's nothing compared to the change that we've seen in the last 20 years with the internet, with Netflix, with, with, you know, with Google Maps, with internet training, with, with the iPhone. Uh, with, and and um, it, what flashed up just there before was a house, a 3D printed house that happened in Dubai last year. Because they can. But the Large Hadron uh, Collider, we've, we've seen Mars explorations and the mapping of the human genome. Incredible. That's in the last 20 years. Today, we see change happening at a frightening pace. We see change happening thanks to CNN and Fox News and Breitbart on a daily basis. <coughs> We've seen globalization that has completely transformed the world. We've seen internet, the internet that has completely transformed industries. In fact, in fact, uh, the, the entire S&P uh, gains of the S&P 500 in 2015 were put down to four stocks, as you probably know. They're the fang ones, you know, Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, and Google. Uh, the internet is disrupting entirely organ entire organizations. Now, globalization has created a large Western underclass that are very angry. And obviously, as we've seen with Brexit, we've seen with Trump, they also get to vote. It's a large Western underclass that generations of politicians have actually left behind. This is very important, and this is going to change the way that we actually do things. And it's obvious for any of us that actually open a window and look outside that we're also rapidly destroying our planet. That's just change happening today. The change that's happening in the next 20 years is going to absolutely blow our mind. We've talked about technology. We've talked about artificial intelligence and, and, um, uh, and advanced robotics. Uh, we, we've, we've briefly mentioned healthcare. We've briefly mentioned uh, even battery technologies. There is so much te technology is going to simply transform the way that we live. We know that. But our environment, we've got global warming. We all agree is actually happening. There's a little bit of debate around, around the loony fringes on whether uh, the, the humans are actually involved. Uh, we have plastic oceans. Have you seen, have you seen what's happening to, it, to our oceans? Which is incredible. Fish stocks are depleting. Bees are depleting. Insect populations are depleting. Over the next 20 years, China is already the most important country in the world. The Chinese leader, Xi, is the most powerful man in the world. We will see the United States of Europe. Unfortunately, we are likely to see a little Britain, uh, that Britain will just start to implode upon, its, upon itself, having left the EU, in my humble opinion. We see increasing isolationism around the world. We don't know what's happening with, with, uh, with the Middle East, with Iran, with Russia, North Korea. 
investment. Back in 2003, the, the ex-Saudi oil minister declared that the Stone Age didn't end because we ran out of stones, and the oil, end, oil age won't end because we ran out of oil. It will end because demand uh, is, is no longer there uh, as it was for the product. I don't think we've, we're at the end of the oil age at the moment. We're certainly at the beginning of the end. But what are we going to see? An ETF bubble? Are we going to see what's going to happen to passive active? And the enormous infrastructure, sclerosis, and the trillion dollars of, 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 uh, of PE dry powder that we see. What is going to happen to that in the next 10 years? Society and business. We've got non-Western attitudes that are going to be the most important ones in the world. We've got new industries. We've got new opportunities. All of this is all I'm trying to say is change is inevitable. I'm not here to predict. I'm just going, goodness me, we better have to face up to this change. It will come in the form of societal change. It will come in the form of organizational change. It will certainly come in the form of personal change because all change is personal. No matter how complex the organizational change that you have all instigated in the past or you have all, all will, be, will be doing in the, in the future, every single Corporation change, every single uh, organizational change is the culmination of hundreds, if not thousands, if not ten thousand, tens of thousands of individual personal changes. And that's a key thing to take away today. All change is personal. Here's a, here's a matrix that I, that I use in my Embracing Change workshops, because, which, which is to help employees actually embrace change. We first did this many, many, many years ago. I'm doing another one in, uh, in January in the UK. Because the CEOs that, that, that do this realize that I need to help my people embrace change. Because change is a very, very personal thing. And, and as I said, the leaders have to embrace change themselves. But most importantly, so do their people. And it doesn't matter how big the change is, how small the change is. It doesn't matter whether I've instigated it or it's been done to me. The most important thing is how we react to change is the important thing. And that can make all the difference. And we all go through this. You've probably seen this before. It's the Kubler-Ross change curve. But we all go through this. We start with shock. We go through to denial. We get angry. We get scared. We get depressed. And then finally, our logical part of us can start to take over and, and we start to understand with our head, we accept with our heart, and then we can move on. And every single one of us goes through this process. But as change leaders, we have to help our people go through this as well. Because if we don't do that, we are going to be one of the 88% of change initiatives that fail. Just pause for a second <coughs> and cough. Just to let that sink in, seven out of eight change initiatives fail to deliver the outcomes that they originally set out to achieve. Now, I sort of felt this. I sort of thought I knew this. But it was a great report from Bain & Co. Uh, of last year that went through and said 88% of change fails. And as soon as I saw that, I knew I had the hook uh, for the book which is available outside, and it's a really good read. Uh, but hook, hook for the book. 88% of change initiatives actually fail. And the key question, of course, on everyone's lips should be why? Now, of course, we know that 60, 70, 80, whatever it is, percentage of mergers and acquisitions fail as well, and for very, very similar reasons. So I'm going to take you through the top 10 reasons why change initiatives fail. The first thing is, we humans, we just don't like change particularly in the business environment. We have this innate desire to just cling on to the status quo. It's probably because it's, we think it's going to affect our back pocket. No, it's definitely because we think it's going to affect our back pocket. Fear of the unknown is, is, a, is an innate human survival instinct. It's fight or flight. You know, we, we, this is evolution at work. We, we, don't, we, we don't know what we don't know, so we're afraid of it. And you can see that in the world of business. As soon as you take someone out of one team and put them into another team, Within 48 hours, they're lobbing rocks. They're throwing rocks at the other team and finding all the faults in the team that they were only in two days ago. It's just a, it's a common thing. We're tribal by instinct. We all know this. And as change leaders, we have to help break down those tribal barriers if we want our people to embrace change because our people are the only ones who are going to deliver the change that we need. Fear of failure is, though, the biggest barrier of change personal barrier of change in the business world. Not only do we fear doing something differently and fail, we fear the consequences of that change. And that's down to our leadership. 
We can also be blamed. If, if someone comes in, a consultant like me rides in and says, that particular process is nonsense, here's a new way of doing it, and, and applause, please. Well, the person in charge of the process is fear, fear that he's going to be blamed for that change. That's very real. Victimhood is insidious, but it's what so many of our people, and sometimes we, end up in. If big change is done to you, it's easy to slip into the comfy slippers of being a victim to say, well, I, I can't do anything about it, woe is me, I'm completely powerless, and that is wrong. You're n we're not completely powerless, but we shouldn't be judging people who become victims. We should just realize it's a normal part, normal reaction to change. We aren't buying what management is selling is a, is a really good bit. In other words, management stands up like this and says, I paint a wonderful vision of the future. We're all going over here. Isn't it fantastic? And one of you is sitting there going, well, I don't think the, the future is going to look anything like that. And the reason why we do that is the, the leaders haven't actually engaged properly with their people to actually explain and to get them to not buy in, but to, to, to share the vision that, they've, uh, that the leaders have set out. And the other one is lack of assistance. Look at all the fears that we've got. And if help isn't forthcoming, then I'm simply going to do absolutely nothing. The second reason why change fails is this great quote from Yogi Berra. But how could you possibly deliver something if you don't know precisely what sort of future, what it's going to look like? How, what is success going to look like? How are you going to measure success? And more importantly, why are we changing? One of the UK's largest investment platforms, actually the largest investment platform, took, brought me in about five years ago before I went off to the desert uh, for three years. <coughs> Excuse me. Brought me in five years ago, and the CEO had said, I've got this great strategy, and I need you to come in and help me align everybody to deliver that strategy. I said, OK, what is the strategy? He said, it's, it, it's really simple. We're going to double assets under management in five years. I went, OK, good. Is that credible? After five minutes, yes, it is credible. Fabulous. And then I said, why? He went, sorry? Yeah. Well, why are you going to double? in five years, well, why do you want to make this change? It's going to be very disruptive. You're going to do a lot of things. Why? And he went, <coughs> he said, uh, well, well it's, it, it's a great opportunity. Uh, we can take advantage of, and then he went into sales mode, and it was great. We could take advantage of market opportunities. Uh, there, are, there are propositions that we could create. We're already number one. We, we could use our co economies of scale. And actually, I bought into it. It was fabulous. And I said, that's fabulous. That's the right reason. What's the real reason? that you're changing. He said, I'm preparing the business for sale. Thank you. I needed to know that. We won't broadcast that, because that's going to upset everybody. And your, right, and your right reason was fabulous. There's a right reason and a real reason for everything. The right reason needs to be just as incredible. Uh, just as incredible? Just as credible. And something that your people can get behind. Third reason why change fails is that the implications aren't understood. Someone said that earlier, and I loved it. Uh, is, is that you really need to understand what are the implications of the change. Let's not just go riding over the hill without actually understanding what's the mess we're going to create as we do this. So as much as possible, understand the implications of the change is what we need to be doing. A huge reason for change failure is an obsession with process over outcomes. Don't let the tail wag the dog. I think I made this statement up. I'm not sure, but because I can't find its provenance, but I really like it anyway. The operation was a complete success. Unfortunately, the patient died. It's all about outcomes. It's not about process. Process is important, but just remember it's only enabler. You know, don't let the tail wag the dog. Inertia is probably my favorite reason why change fails. There are three different types of inertia. The first type of inertia is the challenge, the difficulty of moving from talk to action. And you've seen that in your organization. You've seen that in so many organizations. It's tough enough just to get to the planning stage, let alone actually do something. The second type of inertia is midterm inertia. And I, a change project I liken to a locomotive that is setting off down this track. And as it gathers momentum, nobody can stop it. Nobody can halt it. Nobody can slow it down. And certainly, nobody can change its direction. But what needs to happen is you need to build in a pause for reflection along the way, because it is just normal that events happen and things need to change. You might need to slow that locomotion down, and it might need to be moving that way. And the third type was mentioned earlier today as well, and that's complacency. 
Complacency kills market leaders. And it's not because they're bad, it's not because they're stupid, it's not because they, like ostriches, got their head in the sand at all. It's a common phenomenon that if you are so successful doing things a certain way, it's awfully hard to change that juggernaut around and move it in a, in a different direction. But complacency kills lots of organizations. Another reason is the setup to fail syndrome. Your governance has, been, has set up this project to fail. I've seen, I've seen projects where the steering committee is so large they can't make a decision. I've seen working groups so large that they actually can't do anything. They're too busy talking about it. And, and I've seen decision-making processes that are just unclear. We don't know who's responsible for actually making what decisions. But change initiatives that fail, fail to communicate properly. And proper communication is actually engaging with your people. It's actually, it requires listening. Often, actually far too often, I've been involved in change programs. Oh, actually, I've just thought of a really good example. I'll say that in a second. Um, it, the, the, um, the, the one that I was going to say in the, in, the, in the script going around in my head is that CEOs do what I'm doing. They stand up here and they go, and here's the vision, and it's all wonderful. Um, and then they think everyone's completely taken that on board, and now we can, we can go off. That's not true. You actually need table by table, person by person, to understand what is their motivation, because you're all thinking, what is in it for me? This is great for you. You've got share options. It's fabulous. What is in it for me? And that's the change. <clears throat> the story that I, that I wanted to tell, uh, just to remember, is uh, years ago, I went along, was helping a large financial services organization. They were the, uh, sorry, tech company, the biggest tech company in the UK at the time. And the CEO and the HR director had decided what the new organization was going to look like and what the key jobs were going to be at the top table. So they got everyone around, and me and another change uh, fellow that was there, and, and the CEO stood up, he gave everyone their new jobs and said, and, and said, and this is what we're going to do, and sat down and nothing happened. Then suddenly the, everyone around the table started to complain and the CEO started to get really angry as all of the, because it's the first they'd heard of it, the, the really angry when, when they started to fo fo voice all this criticism. And he finally stood up and banged the table and said, for goodness sake, you're either on the bus or you're under it. And that's not the way to communicate with your people. Another one is really key to know is that emotions trump logic every single time. We know that. We all think we're pretty logical in this room. And in this industry, we think we're very logical. We deal with big data. We deal with lots of data. We do lots of analysis. We're clever. We hire clever people. We hire clever, logical people. We're not logical. None of us are. Emotions actually rule our decisions. You can have a look at Brexit. You can have a look at Trump. But actually, you can just look at every single time we make a decision. It goes on what we call conviction, or what I used to call before I'm getting into investment management, gut feel belief. It, that's how, it, there's, a great, um, um, there's, a, there's a great survey done by the Corporate Leadership Council back in 2003, 50,000 employees worldwide, and they came to the conclusion that emotional commitment's four times more powerful than logical commitment. That's why we fail, because we forget that emotions trump logic every time. The second last key reason why change fails is a change-averse culture. Your culture has got to be ready for change. Your culture has got to be one where people are not afraid to, to actually come up with good ideas, where people are encouraged to come up with new ideas, where people aren't blamed for how things are currently done, and where failure is a learning exercise not a penalty. And the last one is the leadership. Often the leadership doesn't stay the course. You've seen in the, in the last nine examples, the leaders don't, don't, don't set what's, what the change results, what the outcomes look like. The leadership look at process or an outcomes. The leadership don't set it up properly. But this one is they don't stay the course because once you actually move on to implementation, too many leaders then say, oh, for goodness sakes, can we get on with business as usual now? Don't do that because the momentum will just ebb away. So here they are, all 10. <clears throat> Easier to get a book because they're all there and, and, and you don't have to take a, a photo. But this, these are the 10 that why change fails. Weirdly, it's sort of the same 10 with a couple of extras as to what the essential ingredients of successful change are. I won't go through all of these because I've really been through their inverse, but I will just touch on one to end with, and that's the bottom one. 
and that is find your change catalyst. So what is a change catalyst, I hear you ask? Well, I'll tell you what it's not. It's not a program manager, it's not a project manager. It's a business person that with high IQ that actually can sit between the, the leaders and the employees and can be a trusted confidant of both. I've seen time and time again change initiatives that are very hot on process, very high on IQ, but they don't engage people, they don't have an EQ. And a change catalyst will actually deliver the outcomes. That's what their job is. You need a project manager, because they're the process guys, but you also need a change catalyst. In fact, you need both. One is the yin to the other one's yang. And of course, critical to all this is leading change. Your organizations, your leaders need to be able to do the inverse of everything I've been talking about. And the leaders of the organizations that you invest in have got to be able to be very, very, very good leaders of change. They've got to be exemplary leaders of change. That is the number one skill, in my, in my opinion, that they need to develop if their business and your investment is going to be successful. And so I'll just leave you the, with this last quote from, from Charles Darwin. Charles Darwin, everyone thinks that evolution was the is all about survival of the fittest. It's not. He never said that. What he said is, it's survival of those that are most adaptive to change. Thank you very, very, very much. If I'm on, Campbell, before you go, we have a a couple questions for you, if you don't sure. mind. Um, you talked about that a change-ready culture is essential for a successful change. So can you tell us a little bit about how CEOs can ensure that they develop a change-ready culture? Right. Culture. Culture, the, um, culture is absolutely critical. That Bob Diamond, uh, who was CEO of Barclays uh, many, many years ago, uh, said, and I don't think he was the first to say this, he, he said that uh, culture is how people behave when they think nobody is watching. Now, which I think is a frightening example and a frightening description of change. It was just before Barclays was done for rigging the libel rate and he had to step down. But, you know, we, we, we move beyond that. If, if you're trying to create a, a culture that is change ready, the number one thing you need to do is to ask your people. In fact, when any sort of culture, any sort of behaviours, it needs to be values based. And you've got three types of values. One is your brand values, which is what your customers say they are. That's fairly obvious. But your second one, your corporate values, they're not what you put in your annual report. They're not what, what you hang off the ceiling to, uh, to greet your staff as they alight from the lifts every morning. They're actually what your employees say are your values. And your third values are your aspirational values. And I wish more companies would look at it this way. Your aspirational values are the ones you put in your annual report. They're the ones you hang from the ceiling. And if you were able to look at your culture, your values, through those three lenses, and then see the difference, then I, then I think you would end up building a culture that is ready, willing, and able to change. That, that is, as I said before, is, is, is able to... Um, is able to look for opportunities, seek out opportunities, and where where uh, where uh, learning, where, where actually failure is a, is a learning opportunity. But if you look at the values through those three different lenses, um, then you will actually build a culture that is capable of building your your strategy. And I think surely only good things could come from that. Excellent, thank you. <laughs> I think if I ask you one more question, I think sure. David will kill me. So I'm going to stop now and say <laughs> thank you very much, Campbell McPherson. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.